Hey, what is up guys? Murgerman4 here, and uh, today I'm going to be discussing episode 4 of series 12, uh, the first proper historical episode of the season, uh, introducing us to Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison in the 1900s. <laughs> So, as I mentioned uh, in last week's review, I was particularly looking forward to this episode because, um, especially with last season, but even just in general, I tend to really enjoy the historicals. I just find delving into um, aspects of history incredibly fascinating, especially when we meet historical figures. And uh, so, to know that we were going to be going to the early 1900s, I think this episode is set in 1903, uh, and meeting Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison, um, that was pretty exciting for me. And uh, I found the historicals last season to be a high point, uh, and I gotta be honest, I'm not finding it any different this season. Uh, this was a really enjoyable episode, and probably one of my favorites of the entire uh, Whitaker Tribunal era so far. Um, yeah, I, I just, I thought it was really, really good. So, I guess, uh, first off, um, let's talk about Tesla and Edison. Uh, Thomas Edison is very famous for the light bulb. He was a very prominent inventor and businessman. Nikola Tesla also was a very vital inventor, but the way history panned out, he tends to not be remembered all that much. He isn't anywhere near as well known as Thomas Edison, uh, despite being a much more influential and brilliant person. Uh, Thomas Edison's business practices were, I guess, what enabled him to be more well known and better remembered, but really it was Tesla who essentially paved the way for the modern world. And I just thought that this episode was a fascinating look at this unsung hero of modern society. How he was the one who basically created what we now know as the modern world, yet Thomas Edison is the one who is remembered and gets the credit. And this is kind of reflected in uh, well, the doctor, uh, she full well knows uh, the story of Tesla, and she's very excited to meet him. She knows his importance, but none of the companions are actually really familiar with him. They don't recognize his name or know what he's done, and I think that's really telling. Um, I did know who Nikola Tesla was. Uh, I was pretty familiar with him, but I guess it's still more common than I thought that uh, Tesla isn't recognized or known, so I also think that this is a very important episode in that regard. It's giving uh, respect and teaching people about this very important person that a lot of people don't know about or don't recognize. A lot of the time with meeting historical figures, it's people that the general public tend to already know a lot about. But I, I guess in this case, not as many people do know about Tesla. So. That, that's pretty cool, and it gives a good opportunity to educate about him and what he did. And I know a lot of people have problems with uh, some of the educational aspects of Doctor Who. Um, they just want it to be this entertaining show that's completely separated from uh, the fact. They just, they just want to delve right into their own little world. But to me, that's not what Doctor Who is about. Teaching the viewers new things is... One of the best things, I think, about this show, how it uses its premise to be able to enhance the knowledge of its viewers and, you know, make them curious, make them learn about new things. Uh, as with last season, um, whenever some of these educational aspects come up, I always like to do a bit more research to learn more about it because it piques my interest in it. And so, yeah, I just, I, I love that about uh, the historical episodes. I, I love that about this episode. And... I think both the characters of Tesla and Edison are portrayed in really fascinating lights. They, they, they are both complex characters, they're not caricatures. They both feel like real, genuine people. They both have their flaws, but they both have 
good qualities about them as well. Um, now, Thomas Edison, he is obviously, you know, he's not a good person, but he does feel real. Unlike, say, Robertson from last season, a, a character that got a lot of flack. I personally enjoyed him, but I'm not going to lie and say that he wasn't a straight-up caricature. Robertson does not feel like a real person at all, but here they did a great job of just making Edison and Tesla just feel real. And Tesla especially, he has some amazing scenes with the Doctor in particular, uh, where he relates to her about being an inventor and feeling separated from the rest of the world who just can't understand how he sees it. Um, they don't accept him for who he is, and he's got this vision that the rest of the world just doesn't really accept. And it was just a fascinating look into who Nikola Tesla was. Uh, and there is an alien threat in this episode, but this really is Tesla's episode. It, it's a look into him and who he was as a person and understanding what he wanted, what, what he was going through. And I think he's portrayed excellently by, uh, I can't remember what the actor's name is, Goran something? I think his last name was kind of difficult to pronounce, uh, but yeah, he, he, was, he was played excellently. He was very likable and honestly, I think both in terms of how he was written and characterized and how the actor brought him to life, Tesla might now be one of my, if not my favorite, historical figure to have appeared in the show. It was just superb on every level. As I mentioned, though, there is also an alien threat in this episode as well. We have the Scythra, this race of uh, scorpion-like creatures that basically just feed off of other races. They don't do anything for themselves. They just... Oh my goodness. I just... How did I not... I just made a, the connection that the Scythra are like Thomas Edison. How did I not notice that? They're a direct parallel. They're a race who doesn't invent anything for themselves. They just take what others have and kind of reshape it for their own purposes. That's exactly like Thomas Edison. How did I not make that connection before? Well, that, that just gives me a whole new appreciation for them. Because I was going to say before, I mean, I found in this era that the science fiction elements have not been as well integrated into the historicals. They're generally my least favorite aspects of the historical episodes. And while I think that the the aliens here, they, they fit with the story, they worked, they did still feel disconnected. Because like, like I said, Tesla was what the story is about. So they felt a little bit more like background elements, especially because they don't show up until a decent amount into the episode, I don't think. Uh, but now that I realize that, that gives me a whole new level of appreciation. That is, that's really clever. In any case, um, it, the Scythra themselves as aliens, uh, it's, an, it's an interesting concept, but it is something that I would have liked to have seen explored more. There just wasn't room in this episode, and that's probably why the element falls more flat for me, um, as like I said, it tends to do in historical episodes, just because it's not the focus. But they were still good. Uh, they made a suitable threat. I will say they, they do this shape changing thing that I wasn't entirely sure why or how they were able to do that. Um, I guess it's probably similar to what the Krillitanes do. Um, if you remember that from School Reunion back in Series 2, they kind of... I think it was kind of like a perception filter sort of thing where they make themselves look human. So I guess that's probably a similar thing that's going on here. Uh, but... That's, I was kind of iffy about that. That seemed kind of strange to me. But uh, the scorpion creatures themselves, they looked pretty cool. But uh, the main villain was their queen. Uh, she's just known as Queen Scythra. I don't know if her name is just the same name as her race or if that's just, you know, what we're calling her just for simplicity because we don't know her actual name. I also found it kind of strange. I understand why, because 
you needed something to interact off of better than a, a scorpion. But it seemed kind of weird to me that she was more humanoid and then every all the other scorpions were basically straight up scorpions. But she was an interesting design. A lot of people, when they saw her in the trailer, myself included, immediately were, thought of the Rachnos from The Runaway Bride. And there's no connection drawn between the two here, but even while I was watching the episode, I, I, I was surprised that there wasn't any connection drawn because mainly with Queen Scythra, uh, she seemed very similar to the Queen of the Rachnos, not just in her head design, but also in the way that she was shot with a lot of close-ups and uh, the way she was introduced with some very quick cuts. It was very reminiscent of how the Queen of the Rachnos was introduced. So I was expecting there to be some sort of connection there. Maybe there was and it ended up getting cut. That wouldn't surprise me. But it did feel kind of strange because she never really felt like she had her own identity. It just felt like it was kind of mirroring uh, from the Runaway Bride. But, I don't know, she, she was fine. Um, I will say, at the end, when she comes down to Earth from her spaceship and the Doctor confronts her face to face, that is a really great scene. It's probably some of the most serious material 13 has had so far, and she it's probably one of the most threatening she's been as well. Uh, so that was actually really good to see, because normally she's a lot more optimistic, happy-go-lucky kind of character, and she has had her moments of seriousness. Uh, for example, like in Rosa, when she confronts Krasko, but this was probably the most serious she's ever been. And uh, she kind of reminded me of Ten, when she's like, I've given you a chance and you refused it. Um, kind of reminded me of the Tenth Doctor with his no second chances sort of thing. So it's certainly interesting uh, to see if this is going to develop any further because she definitely seems more willing to leave her enemies in a tough spot here than she was in series 11 so I'm interested in seeing where that goes. Unfortunately though um, if there is one big problem with the episode I mean I wouldn't say it's a big problem but it was kind of noticeable is that the companions are pretty superfluous throughout. Uh, they don't really do anything. They're not really necessary to the plot. Especially Graham, unfortunately. He didn't... At, at least Ryan and Yaz had their moments, but ultimately they don't really have much going on and I continue to think that even though I, I do fully believe that Three Companions can be done correctly. It, it just, it is too much. I think particularly for the new series format. Because none of them really get their own time to shine. It's, it's just challenging to balance them all. And it really would work better, I think, with just one or two companions. Which is a shame, because I really would like to see this work. And sometimes it does, but more often than not, it doesn't. And this episode, as much as I enjoyed it, is one of the episodes where they feel the least present. I don't know, they're, they're very forgettable in what they do in this episode, which is a shame. Don't get me wrong, they're, they're enjoyable, as always, but they're just ultimately, they just don't really contribute much, is all. But yeah, I found this to be, overall, a very enjoyable episode, one of the best of Whitaker's and Chibnall's era so far, I am actually really surprised that it's taken us this long to finally meet Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison in, I think, any medium. I don't know if there actually has been any story, definitely not on TV, obviously, but I don't even think Tesla and Edison have appeared in books or comics or audio dramas, and that actually really surprises me. Because these are very important people in the development of the modern world. And it's pretty crazy it took this long to get to seeing them, but I'm really glad that they did because it was a fascinating story. And it was, it was just a ton of fun. I, I gotta say, I loved it. Oh, I forgot to mention, actually, that this is also our first script of the season, written by a new writer, uh, Nina Matevier, I think is her name. Um, she actually served as a script editor on a couple episodes of Series 11, but this is her first actual script for the show, and it's, it's really good stuff. 
I would not be averse to her coming back anytime. Good for her. This is a great first showing for her talents. But, um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Um, I'm actually surprised. I didn't have a ton of stuff to say about this episode, at least not compared to the last few, but what can I say? I, I really enjoyed it, and I thought it was great. So, I guess um, I'd probably give it an 8.5 out of 10. So, in terms of Series 12, that would place it well above Orphan 55, and uh, just below Spyfall. I guess, honestly, that would probably make it the third, my third favorite episode of the era so far, uh, Second Greatest Story. So, that, that's pretty good. Um, I will say as well that it, it improved on a second viewing for me. I did really enjoy it the first time as well, but I enjoyed it even more upon uh, second viewing. And with that, uh, it brings our Series 12 average up to a 7 out of 10. Um, not quite as high as I would like it to be, thanks to Orphan 55, but we've still got five more stories left to go, and uh, I'm sure that that average is just going to keep on going up. So next week we have the Jadoon returning uh, for the first time properly since their introductory story 13 years ago. They've had cameos since then, but this is the first time that they're actually going to have like a prominent presence in the episode. They're going to be a, a main focus of it. So that's pretty exciting. But uh, yeah, that's my thoughts on Nikola Tesla's Night of Terror. And uh, please leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. I'll see you next week with Fugitive of the Jadoon.